the Minnesota chapter of the Hells Angels are holding a secret planning meeting for their infamous USA run. Police plan to surveil the clubhouse and identify important Hells Angels leaders in town for the meeting. The Minneapolis police are worried about the Hells Angels rival club, the Outlaws, based in neighboring Wisconsin. I think what you'll see today is your East Coast officers showing up. You're going to see a lot of pre-planning for the USA run. That's going to be the primary topic of discussion. And I think they're definitely going to be talking about the fact that the outlaws are going to be right next door when this event occurs. And how are they going to handle that? Olmott and Cook start by canvassing the area to determine how many bikers are in town. Yeah, go ahead. They get a tip that a group of Hells Angels have been spotted outside a local funeral home. How many HAs came up here in India? Uh, 30 and 35. Well, I'm sure he's the two are surprised at the number of bikers in town. Outlaw motorcycle clubs in the U.S. are on the rise. One group targeted for recruitment is the U.S. military. You know, anytime you have uh, any kind of military action, uh, like we're having right now in Iraq and Afghanistan, you do get a percentage of guys that come back that uh, definitely identify with this lifestyle. There are members of these gangs that are currently deployed overseas that gives them an excellent opportunity to fill people out, uh, to be around them in combat situations, potentially, and to uh, see if they have what it takes. According to police, even at a solemn event like a funeral, biker gangs do not suspend their criminal activities. Just because they're at a funeral doesn't mean that, you know, they're not armed or that they're not, you know, carrying drugs or using drugs. It's pretty commonplace for them to have at least a vehicle in the parking lot that has weapons in it so that the other members know where to go if they need to access something. Uh, I can see a couple prospects out front, but... Before the funeral ends, neighbors across town report that a large group of bikers are having a party at a private residence. Yeah, so we got little bikes lined up there. What do you see down there, Steve? I know I saw Las Fuentes, and obviously the uh, Freeman just pulled up. The Hells Angels don't treat all biker clubs as sworn enemies. Groups of clubs who work with the Hells Angels are showing up around the city. In the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, because this is Hells Angels territory, they run the show up here, so everybody's subordinate to them, but they're all equally involved in criminal activities, predominantly drug trafficking. There's at least three biker clubs here. The Hells Angels use gangs like these to let them know what's going on in the area. That way, if a rival gang's trying to make an inroad, these are the guys that are going to tip you off. Uh, these guys are also people that they're going to use to run their drugs, uh, to commit some of their criminal activities for them, because, again, it insulates the Hells Angels. If these guys get jammed up, that doesn't have any direct re reflection back on the Hells Angels. They're out in front of the clubhouse right now. They're talking at the clubhouse. It's getting a lot of activity buzzing there now again. Yeah, we're rolling now from... Uh... Omar and Cook head to the clubhouse. The Hells Angels have lookouts posted, a sure sign that something is going on. Yeah, Chris and Jeff, we're in the area. Outside the Minneapolis clubhouse, Olmott and Cook are concerned. The vice president is now also on lookout duty, a role usually reserved for rookie club members called prospects. So we've got the vice president out there standing out on the street. That just seems a little odd. Captain Chris Olmott, who is leading the law enforcement surveillance team, makes a difficult decision and feels compelled to break cover to find out what's going on. In a situation like this, I don't have an issue letting them know that I'm out here. And uh, it's both for their security and our security. And I told him if there's any issues to give me a call, and he um, he said he wouldn't do that, and I'm sh that the reason they wouldn't do that is because it's like being a snitch. They're not going to snitch. So 
The vice president is tight-lipped and tells Omad he has everything under control. Omad isn't buying it. The East Coast officers' meeting is still hours away. Omad and Cook leave the Hells Angels clubhouse to continue keeping watch across the city. They soon get word that back at the clubhouse, a prospect drives off in a gray car. Omot suspects he's en route to pick up one of the leaders who's arrived from out of town. There's the Megan right there. And there's our, there's our trail car right there. That's... You gotta love technology. Gotta love it, yeah. Oh, here's the car right here coming right at us. So I'm gonna just keep on driving like nothing's happening. Omad and Cook follow the car. Can they make a U-turn there? No, they're checking for a tail. Yeah, they can. Omad and Cook want to make some positive IDs. They are trying to determine exactly who they are dealing with. An illegal U-turn gives them the chance. An officer in Omad's team pulls over the Hell's Angels. Oh, they got them stopped, actually. They got them stopped over here. There's another familiar face. Bald headed guy, we had him stop, uh, stop in Branson. He's usually got a pretty good attitude problem. He's bad. Go ahead and photograph these guys for you. Let's just take a picture real quick, sir. I know you're from New York. You want my license, you can check all my. You don't need my photo. Okay. You guys got your own database, you got everything. Okay. All right? I mean, be fair. You know, you're pulling us over, you're yeah. stopping us from just, you know, being here. So mm -hmm. if you want to, you know, give us tickets or do what you got to do, then give us tickets. Okay. Uh, you guys are, you know, dragging us out like, you know, with some kind of. I don't know what... What I'm trying to say is, is we're going to do what we're going to do. Right, right, I'm going right. to take some pictures right. while I'm out here. Take a picture real quick, sir. One member was definitely a sergeant at arms. I did note that the sergeant at arms had his tequila patch, which means that, you know, he has assaulted a law enforcement officer before. He also had a filthy few patch, which, you know, filthy few patch is known to be given to members who've killed for the club. So, obviously, a mover and shaker, definitely. You know, somebody of note and, uh the exact kind of person that they would be sending to a meeting like this. I swear, Jeff. I thought he had, a gun. he had this in the door handle when he reached his license and fell out. The driver had a ball peen hammer, which is a pretty common weapon that these guys use. They're something that, you know, we're definitely aware of. New York's representatives for the meeting are given a warning and released. Back at the clubhouse, more than 50 delegates come and go. But there's no trouble, and frustratingly for police, no intel on what was discussed inside. In four months, Omar and his team will be in Carlton, keeping a close eye on the USA run the Hells Angels planned today. Because one percenter biker gangs are nationwide, Police are forming alliances to monitor biker activity. Halfway across the country, in Oregon, one of Omad and Cook's allies in the war against outlaw bikers is Detective Dave Burroughs. He is battling a sudden influx of Mongols into Eugene, Oregon. Burroughs is an undercover officer and cannot be seen on camera. Yeah. The outlaws, the Mongols, have allied themselves in a war against the Hells Angels. The Hells Angels throughout the world, we believe, is somewhere right around 32 to 3,500 members. The Mongols have approximately five to 600 members. Their logo is a Mongol warrior wearing sunglasses and astride a chopper. The motorcycle club was established in 1969 in Montebella, California. Like the first outlaw motorcycle clubs in the 1940s, most Mongols were former U.S. servicemen, this time veterans of the Vietnam War. Like the Hells Angels, the Mongols have their own patches and symbols. This is the Mongol skull and crossbones. I've been told by a Mongols member that this means that that person took care of business for the club. And what that means is they've committed some kind of act of violence on behalf of the club, either against another club or against law enforcement. The one percenter Mongol forever, forever Mongol. It's a one percent diamond. 
Uh, that means they consider themselves to be 1% of the motorcyclists who live outside the law. In Oregon, police are closely monitoring the Mongols' expansion into their state. Years earlier, the growth of the Mongol Motorcycle Club in California sparked a violent turf war with the Hells Angels. Yeah, there was a lot of blood spill, definitely. But that's what happens when you go to war. I'm not going to deny the fact that we're not violent. We're very violent, but only when pushed. I already lost one war in Vietnam. I wasn't about to lose another one. The turf war over California led to the deaths of several Hells Angels and Mongols. The clubs eventually reached a fragile truce. Police in Oregon are intent on preventing another one percenter gang war. There is reason for concern. The Mongols... There's nothing wrong with that. You want to take my patch and have me not wear it, uh, it doesn't mean I'm going to stop being a Mongol. You're just not going to know who the Mongols are anymore. Once you're a Mongol, you're always a Mongol. We're not changing into another club. We're not going to fly another patch. We're Mongols. Mike McCartney is a former member of the Mongols. We're the baddest of the bad, the hardcore of the hardcore. Our hearts are pretty much into this lifestyle 100%. We live and breathe and die for our club. McCartney played a key role in the Mongols' East Coast expansion, often encroaching into enemy turf. In a dangerous move, he chartered a Mongols club in Hells Angels New York Territory. According to McCartney, the Hells Angels retaliated by greenlighting him. If you're green-lighted, that means there's a price tag on your head to, to remove you out of that picture. Because in their eyes, if you're removed out of that equation as a leader, 99% of the time, those guys that are under you are going to be scared to take off. Currently, the Mongols are in a state of expansion. Last fall, the club quietly charted the first of four chapters in Oregon. Flying their colors and wearing the state rocker without the permission of Oregon's existing biker gangs could provoke turf wars. There are five one percenter outlaw biker clubs in Oregon. The new Mongol chapters are patching over members from other one percenter clubs and causing problems. In Eugene, Oregon, police plan to deter violence between the one percenter clubs. Detective Dave Burrows works undercover and cannot be seen on camera. Tonight, we're going to go out and try and gather some intelligence from the Free Souls church meeting. Uh, the Free Souls are the oldest and the largest uh, motorcycle gang in the state of Oregon. Uh, every weekend, they hold a church meeting where they get together and talk about club business. So a part of what we want to do tonight is identify prospects, um, and if we can get a stop on them, uh, for some kind of violation to further identify them, that would be great. In Oregon, the Free Souls and two other local clubs are aligned with the Hells Angels. This makes the Mongols their natural enemy. For police, gathering intelligence on one percenters can be dangerous. I think keep in the back of your mind that uh, sometimes they have a follow car um, just keep in mind uh, the idea about a possible ambush at any time about uh, these guys. As always, use officer safety. Um, expect there's going to be weapons, uh, whether they're legal or not. All right, let's hit it. Detective Burroughs and Officer White head to the clubhouse. Free Souls are all homegrown guys. They've been around since 1969, so we get there's a lot of older members. They've started to recruit a lot of younger members. In like the last two or three years, they went from kind of a 40, 50, 60s club to a, a lot of guys in their 20s and 30s coming in. When they were started in the late 60s, they were fairly closely aligned with the Hells Angels. They don't want the Mongols here. The Free Souls members I've talked to have allayed their fears that there's a war between the Free Souls and the Mongols.
Mongols or any of the orange clubs in the Mongols are going to swarm the state and it's going to be an all out war. They stop at the clubhouse. The Free Souls Church meeting has started. During church meetings, women and prospects have to wait outside. Burroughs asks to speak with a member of the club. He wants the bikers to know they're in the area. Being visible is one way to deter a turf war. The Free Souls member Burroughs spoke with has his own deterrent. He's got a permit to carry a concealed weapon. That you can see the outline of his pistol under his uh, vest. In the past, when I've stopped that guy, he's had two pistols. And so the, what you end up with is you'll get a guy who's a felon, and he won't have a, a pistol or a, a restricted weapon, but his buddy that's sitting right next to him has two. So there's always guns around the club. Later that night, Burroughs' team patrols the area around the Free Souls Clubhouse to gather intelligence. They pull over several members and prospects for violations. The following night in Portland, Burroughs and Officer White assist the police. The Mongols are throwing a party. Local one percenter clubs could choose this night to challenge them. Law enforcement ran some surveillance operations today around the uh, funeral of an outsider's member. Uh, we had concerns with the uh, Mongols party here and that's in town at the same time that there may be trouble between the clubs. There was a lot of members in town, uh, at least 100 members from the Oregon clubs. And it looks like we probably have about 30 to 40 Mongols at least in town. Tensions are high. Police keep a close eye on one percenter clubhouses and haunts. <clears throat> to our right is the uh, clubhouse for the Gypsy Joker Motorcycle Club. They've been historically the most powerful club in Oregon. Officers are out in force tonight to prevent a violent confrontation between biker clubs. And to gather intelligence on the number of one percenters in town and where they are from. That looks like there's probably about 15 to 20 motorcycles out there. I also saw numerous uh, vehicles out there that belongs to some of our Oregon Mongols. Uh, throughout the night, I've seen members from Eugene, Portland, Medford, members from San Jose, Los Angeles, and San Diego. All right, we've got uh, several members standing outside. You can see their uh, new colors. Uh, a couple of Gypsy Joker members hanging out with them. <laughs> That's how they talk to all law enforcement if they can. Their motto is respect for you, fear none. On this night, the Mongols and local one percenter clubs coexisted without incident. And Detective Burroughs and Officer White notice an interesting development. This is the first time we've seen the uh, Gypsy Jokers and the Mongols hanging out together in the same place. No speculation. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean they're allies. It doesn't mean they're friends. Uh, we don't know. Looks like Portland has things under control. Uh, we're going to go ahead and call it a night and head back to Eugene. Sounds good to me. <laughs> 